The rough usually tells you what kind of shape to cut. You're not gonna try to plan it all out. You're just gonna do and allow for things to align for you. Hey guys, we are at the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show and we are with Nolan Sponsler, who is a professional gem cutter and goldsmith. And I understand you have some pretty cool pieces to show us today. Yes, I do. I'm going in totally blind. Okay, so I, I cool. have no clue what we're about to see. Here's the first one for you. Oh. So we got a fancy box inside the box. The box is beautiful. Oh my gosh. Ah, <laughs> look at that. I'm actually kind of speechless at that. Oh, you okay. haven't even seen the back yet. <laughs> oh, look at that. Okay, you gotta just dive right in. Tell us what's going on here. Yeah, so um, this is a culmination of all the skills I've acquired over the last seven years being a jeweler. The stones you see in the back are Russian demantoid garnets, Australian sapphires, and diamonds. That color of demantoid is incredible bright, vibrant green, oh my god! Yeah, you don't come across them too often. No. For the front, then it's platinum with an 18 karat gold guilloche plate. Guilloche is an engraving pattern that you can do on rose engine lays. Okay, you're gonna have to like explain that to <laughs> us, because I don't sure. know what that is. Yeah, so ornamental turning lathes, they were developed in either the 14th or the 16th century. They used to cost about two lifetimes worth of earnings. Traditionally used in wood and ivory, but me and a few friends in the industry are working on developing the rose engine to cut gemstones as well. Here's what I could do in metal. That is incredible. Like, how does that machine work? It's extremely hard to explain. <laughs> it has rosettes on them, and these cutouts with patterns along the outside. And the whole mechanism is balanced, and it leans over to one side or the other. And then you have the piece that you're holding that's attached to this whole mechanism. And then you have your cutter, in this case, a graver for cutting metal, and you're pressing the graver into the piece that you're cutting and the piece is moving in and out following the pattern of the rosette and depending on what rosette you use you can create different patterns. Oh my gosh that is phenomenal. How long does that take? Something like that a few hours. This piece only took you oh, a few hours? Oh no that the, oh. just the guilloche plate. Oh I was like uh, you that, are efficient. <laughs> yeah right that piece took me about 120 hours. Uh, that is still really efficient. Yeah I will. Yeah, when you, <laughs> well, I'm a professional. <laughs> no, I mean, when you when you do it for so long, it, you get quicker at it. So. Okay, so you're obviously young. You said seven years. I started in 2015. So 2015, you're like five years old. <laughs> How did you get into jewelry making? My junior year of college, some tragic thing happened where me and my roommates um, were actually involved in an armed robbery at our apartment. They opened fire on us and I witnessed my roommate get shot in the face right in front of me. Oh my god! And that experience led me to dropping out. I was dealing with mental issues, um, PTSD and social anxiety. I, I didn't have any money and I wasn't going to school anymore. So uh, I had a friend who was a jeweler and they were looking for an apprentice. So I just said, why not? About two years into working there, I worked out of those issues and found myself with some jewelry skills. I wanted to find a way that I could branch out on my own. I thought if I could cut my own gems and now I can set them, I think that would be a cool way to separate myself. There's a pretty cool Instagram community out there. It's a bunch of jewelers that are making jewelry art and we're all kind of growing together as a community. There's so much to look at in this piece. Do you own this or is this yeah, someone's collection? Yeah, I mean, I just rock it for fun, but I'm definitely uh, looking, for, looking for, for a collector. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so here's the second piece. With a fancy box. With a box. box. A yeah. box in a box. The guy that I bought my turning lathe from made these boxes. David Lindau, one of the founders of Plumier Foundation, which is in Rye, New York. It's uh, basically a museum of ornamental turning lathes. Oh my gosh. Look at that. Okay, explain what we've got here. What you're looking at is Sleeping Beauty Turquoise. It's from Arizona with 18 karat gold. The beads are amethyst and Turkish purple jade. That is sujolite on the end. And then this piece? That is just a 18 karat gold bale with a Cambodian zircon that I cut. Yeah, the zircon pops. It does, Look yeah. At that. So that was a design that I came up with specifically to show off the dispersion for zircons. Yeah. So that's the backside, really. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Wow, that's... 
And then you flip it over, that is, that's the front. So this is a collaboration with my partner, Saf Brooks. He goes by Inward Spectrum on Instagram. I'm telling you right now, he's gonna go down as one of the best jewelers in history. That is incredible. You know, it's funny, these are completely different pieces and yet so similar. Do you feel like you can, you've developed such a style where people can be like, oh yeah, that's his work. It's a process, you know, you don't wanna develop a, a style and then be stuck. We're young and we're still trying to develop and work out what that style is. That is so pretty. And Here's one more pendant. Oh, oh my gosh, it looks like candy. For sure. The luster is really throwing me off. I have no clue what that is. <laughs> so that is an Australian sapphire. It would be considered what they call a, a pharaoh's eye sapphire. That's when a yellow sapphire grows in the core and then blue sapphire grows around. Okay. To find the core with the blue around it is fairly rare and for that size is extremely rare. And relatively clean. Oh yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's flawless, almost wow. 10 carats. It was such a pretty stone, I didn't want to cut it. So all I did was polish the natural surface and then I flattened the back of it and polished the back so that you could see clearly into the stone and see all the color zoning. You clearly work with a lot of different materials. Do you have a favorite? My favorite would be tourmaline. Oh, I love tourmaline. I actually brought one with me. I oh. brought two of them with me. So this first one is a collaborative gemstone, something that I worked on with two of my colleagues, Saf Brooks and Ryan Anderson. Can I touch it? Yeah. Do we need gloves? Yeah, please do. Oh my God. So that's a, a tricolor from the Congo. So there's the red, and then there's the yellow, and then green. So tell me how you go from the rough to something like this. Like, how, what do you see there? The rough usually tells you what kind of shape to cut. You're just working to cut inclusions out and maximize yield. And yeah, the design kind of just came about. The faceting pattern that we did on the pavilion, we cut at reflective angles so that when you put a carving on one side, it reflects the carving like a mirror on the other. And then at certain angles, it also will reflect the carving that we did on the crown. So it just gives you a real dimensional gemstone. That is so cool. Let's look at more gems. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I got another tourmaline for you. Oh, oh my God. So this is a Nigerian rubellite. Rubellite is one of my favorite yeah. gemstones. And that color is incredible. Yeah, it's as good as it gets. All of that detail is on the base and then you can see it through the crown. Yeah. Tourmaline can be a huge pain because the way that it's mined in a lot of places, they're blasting it out of the ground. Those blasts can make it really fragile. Before coming to Tucson, I would gotten this Nigerian tourmaline it's out of this specific pocket in Nigeria that were watermelon colored and they had a pink core with the green rind on it. And they're really cool stones and I preformed it and it didn't crack when I preformed it. So I thought, okay, maybe this will work. In preparation for Tucson, I cut it and it, I put it down to the lap and I picked it up and the thing popped oh right in front God. of my eyes. One piece like shot at me, another piece shot off on the distance and one was just stuck on the lap. Oh my gosh. Yeah, all gem cutters will tell you they've had a tourmaline crack on them. I'm guessing you wear goggles? No. From a distance, you don't use any sort of magnification when you're doing this? I'll use a loop if I need to check facet meets and such, but for the most part, I can see it pretty well. My eyes have never been that good. That's <laughs> incredible. Next one. Let's go with these topazes. So I cut this pair for an amazing couple. Look at that. Yeah, those are natural topazes from Brazil. The pattern in there is called the infinite love pattern. And that's the star of David with a heart within it. And then the infinity symbol within the heart. I love that. This is right along the same kind of design, but with using the new tools that I have wow. developed. That's a Bolivian ametrine. One of the first things that popped out to me was how saturated that purple is. The cut that I went with with this was to avoid blending those colors together. And so that you could see the kind of almost tripeachy like yes. zoning. But it's funny, from here. Yeah, from the side view, they, they blend. Yeah. But then straight on. You can see the different zoning. So clearly. That is amazing. Some stones, a lot of planning goes into it, but the planning can often just get you stuck and get into some creative block rather than just jumping into it 
and allowing yourself to get into flow and and let ideas come to you while you're working on it. You have extremely nice materials on the table. So I'm curious, like, is there any sort of hesitation or fear when you're cutting any of these that, that you'll mess up or? There used to be when I was first cutting really high-end material, but it's just rock. It's just, just a rock, no big deal. <laughs> as long as you follow, you know, you, you do what you're supposed to do, it typically turns out well for you. Huh. Yeah. That sounds a lot easier than I feel like it <laughs> actually is. Faceting is very meditative. I'm, oh, I'm sure. Yeah, you just, it's a place that I can go and not have to think about any of the stresses going on or, you know, and I can just be focused on one task. There's no really rhyme or rhythm to it. I just, just go for whatever is feeling right. For it. Yeah. You were made specifically to do this. Like. I guess, yeah. Got one more. And this is a, an experimental stone, which is one of the first stones that I cut with a friend of mine, Brian Drummond. Him and I together developed the Rose Engine tools to be able to cut this stone. It's a fairly inexpensive material, Oro Verde quartz. It's a green gold quartz. The pattern on there was what I was describing to you with the rosettes. It's the only one of its kind right now. What do you mean by that? Meaning that the entire stone was carved with the rose engine. We're gonna continue developing these new tools as well as find purposes for old tools. I recently just acquired an ornamental lathe from 1890. Traditionally, this machine was used to make the patterns on banknotes. We're gonna convert it to to cut gems to do some new designs that no one's ever seen before. That is incredible. You have made something of yourself very quickly for how young you are. And so like you you really got after it. Yeah, well, when you come so close to, to dying, it changes your perspective on life and there's really no time to waste. You make the most of every day and Things happen that you would never expect. Very beautiful things happen. Advice for someone breaking into lapidary or jewelry making, I would highly advise that you reach out to people that you follow that you're fans of their work and ask if you can learn from them. That's what I did. My mentor for many years is Mark Oros at Hash New Stones. I reached out to him on Instagram and asked if he would have me up to, to learn gem cutting. And I went and spent a weekend with him and after that took out two credit cards and bought my <laughs> faceting machines. You're not gonna try to plan it all out. You're just gonna do and allow for things to align for you. I am glad that they have aligned for you. Yeah. That's great. So typically at the end, we take a closer look of like our favorite. So we have to pick one. Oh, okay. But I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna do two. Jewelry and gem, I feel like that's fair. Sure. Okay, so this, I just can't not <laughs> have a closer look at this. I think this is so stunning. And then the rubai, I just, I. <laughs> so let's take a closer look. Thank you so much for coming on the channel. We've seen so many different types of materials, designs. You're so talented and we're really grateful to have you. If you guys wanna learn more about a variety of other materials, go to gemstones.com where you can learn about every gem your heart desires. Make sure to keep up with Nolan on Instagram and TikTok and we'll include his handles for you below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that bell so you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Thanks for watching.